You're listening to the Creatorpreneur Podcast, Episode 17, and today I'm going to share with you how to fill your email list with buy ready leads using quizzes and assessments with pet behaviorist Daniel Largo. So stay tuned. Hello, my name is Rodney Washington, author, artist, and entrepreneur, and I'm passionate about helping creatives just like you do what lights you up and make a comfortable living while doing it. Each week, I'll be sharing timely business growth, marketing, and mindset hacks and interviews with courageous creative entrepreneurs to inspire you to get paid for your creativity. So grab your favorite beverage, sit back, and enjoy today's show. Today's episode is sponsored by my free downloadable PDF checklist, How to Create a Highly Irresistible List Building Freebie and Attract Your Perfect Customers the Easy Way. Stop guessing what your ideal audience wants and start filling your email list with buy-ready people actively searching for your digital products, online courses, artwork, workshops, retreats, and one-on-one services. To grab your copy, visit my website at getpayforyourcreativity.com forward slash freebie checklist. Okay, perfect. All righty. Welcome, everyone. This is I'm so, so excited to have my very special guest, my very special friend and just so many things I can't even go into in the length of time that we have here. But uh, Danielle Largo, I mentioned Danielle in uh, episode number 16 of the podcast, and there are many reasons why I chose her for a part of this series, which is on uh, list building and building your email list. But I chose her for many things. One, because I have seen her trajectory from when she started her business. Uh, well, she was actually already in business when I met her, and we're going to talk about that just kind of briefly, um, how we met about nine years ago, I believe, and at a conference or I guess a business networking meeting, if you will, and she was in a totally different business at that time. And I feel like if you're one of those kinds of people that believe in something is divine, it's like supposed to happen, um, I feel like that Danielle for that, she and I for each other was, was that because it was, I'm going to just go there and just say it, it was nothing but God is the reason why the she and I connected. Um, looking at all the circumstances, <laughs> which we'll talk about here in a second, um, it was unlikely that the two of us probably would have met other than that it was just meant to be. So the, the, the our journey together and what I've seen her do just over the last nine years has been nothing short of miraculous. And I want her to share a lot about that in this interview. I don't want this to be one of those dry, just technical kind of things where do this and do that. We'll get to some of those things. But what I really want you to get out of what we're sharing today is that it's really important to trust your instincts and follow your intuition and, and try to listen for guidance to go where you need to go and and go with what's presented to you and trust that you're getting the right messages at the right time. And I believe that um, it really can go a long way towards moving you in the direction that you want to go as you're growing your business. As I said, there's a lot of technical things and a lot of information out there about how to do 20 different things. And a lot of it's confusing and much of it's much of it is very unnecessary which is one of the reasons, too, why I wanted to have Danielle on this particular uh, podcast interview, because she's one of those kinds of people that when everyone's going right, she goes left. And there's a lot of good lessons and nuggets in that. So I really want you to listen very closely to what she shares, because it's going to help you as you are planning and getting clarity about what your next steps are. What she does to grow her list may not ultimately be what you do, but I think there's a lot in this and what she's going to share. And it's very unique from the traditional type of list building activities that a lot of online marketers tell you to do. Um, It is grown in popularity, but I saw her doing this before it became popular. So again, that's another nugget uh, to listen for. So get your notebooks out, take some notes. You're going to want to listen to this again. I'm going to provide a lot of resources for you on the show notes page, which you can get at getpaidforyourcreativity.com forward slash 017. Also, before I bring on Danielle, I just wanted to give a heads up that there was a little bit of technical issue with the interview, the recording, I should say, of the interview uh, on my end. There was uh, seemed to be a bit of an issue with um, some scratchiness with my part of the interview. So I wanted to apologize for that. Um, Danielle... 
uh, voice sounds pretty clear. It's a little bit of a uh, little bit of issue with hers, but not near as uh, more obvious as my <laughs> portion of it, unfortunately. So I do want to apologize for that uh, going forward. And um, but the nuggets are there, the information's there, and um, I know you're going to get a lot out of it. So enjoy. Hello, my friend. Welcome to the podcast. Hi. I'm so happy to be here. You're doing such an awesome job. Yeah, glad to have you. Glad to have you. You know, Danielle and I met at a conference about nine years ago where we both knew the person we were going there to see, but it wasn't about the person we were going there to see. Not at all. (laughs) Not at all. So I love the way you tell the story. I'm going to let you tell the story, but it's always on all my voice and, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, um, I had another company before this. I was one of those people born to be an entrepreneur. And I went um, seeking some pearls of knowledge from this really fabulous uh, individual. And I felt really led to go there. I'm one of those people that really listen to my my gut, um, my instincts, God. It really... Uh, I I really have a really sensitive uh, device when it comes to that, and um, that's what guides me in my life. And I really felt to go, and I didn't know why I was there, um, but I always say I'll know it when I see it. And I was mingling, kind of had some Pellegrino, and um, it wasn't really floating my boat, to be honest with you. You know, but I was being polite. People were huddled together in their little groups, and the host was mingling and so on. And I just was kind of staying by the door where you entered, and in came Rodney. I had never met him before, but immediately I knew that was who I had to introduce myself to. And he was just coming through the door looking around, and I zeroed on him like a shark in a feeding frenzy. <laughs> and, um Rodney is a pretty, you know, he has a pretty big stature, but I'm 5'10", and I was coming, and he was in my gaze, and he saw me coming, and he was looking like, oh, my goodness, what in the world? And we laugh about it because um, I made a beeline to him, introduced myself, and long story short, we ended up talking and sitting in the back of the room probably being a little disruptive, no disrespect intended, but he has a great sense of humor, and so do I, and it's like we had known each other for years, and we exchanged information, and um, I met up with him. I felt led to call him, and when I did, I was telling him about what, you know, I was doing, and he's listening to me, not really saying much, and I felt to bring this book, which is how my whole movement started, um, of teaching children to be humane to animals, and I had it laid out in story um, board form, and he looked at me, and his eyes got really big, and he said, Danielle, this is a book. I said, yeah, I know, but I don't know how to put it together, and he said, I can help you do that, and this is how this journey started and over the years it's cultivated um, into basically family and I really am proud of what Rodney is doing because I really nudged him to do this because he has a lot of gifting around speaking to people, educating people, connecting people together, and just technically one of the most brilliant minds that I have come across, and that's a big compliment coming from me. And he saw me just evolve this company, and I'll just pause there and let you ask whatever you want to ask going Mm -hmm. forward. Yes. Oh, well, thank you so much for saying that. I really appreciate that. That means a lot to me. You know, this is the thing that I really want to just talk about to further address what you just said, is that I believe that all of us, especially as creatives, I feel that a lot of us take what we do, our gifts, if you will, for granted. Um, Because something comes easy to us, we don't really think of it as, quote unquote, a gift, whatever that may be, cooking, painting, photography, whatever. Uh, you know, training pets or what have you. 
And what, what I feel like what happens is that we discredit it and we don't acknowledge it for what it is. And almost to the point when people ask us about it, we sort of look at, sometimes we can look at people like, it's nothing. It's like it's second nature. Doesn't everyone do this or know this or what have you? But what I want to share or what I want to say as I'm talking about this is that's the thing that you really should be paying attention to, the things that people are always acknowledging you for, complimenting you on, giving you, you know, uh, praise, if you will, about. Because that's really where your core gifting is, as Danielle's gifting is being able to communicate with pets, animals. So, again, I think this is a really key point to really pay attention to that and to not ignore it. And so with that said, I'm spending a little extra time talking about this particular aspect of it because, again, it is the core of everything that we're going to talk about on this episode, being able to be connected to what your gifting is so that you can then use that to be able to create the opportunities that you will for the people that you're here to serve by you really tapping into and listening to what what your thing is, as Danielle's going to talk about more, she's going to share her story in just a moment. Once you learn to tap more into that and listen to that inner guidance, you'll know then how to address or que- uh, talk to, speak with, and address questions to the people that you're ultimately going to be creating your irresistible, irresistible freebie for. But it starts with you acknowledging and accepting what your gift is, what you're here to do, how you help, how you serve, so that you can then tune in and then be able to listen with fuller ears, if you will, uh, what it is that the person you're here to serve needs. You can hear more of what's the concerns and the things that they're struggling with. You'll know how what questions to ask and how to ask them and how to get, extract the answers that you need so that you can make the best possible introductory offer to invite them into your world. So I'm going to let Danielle tell you her story and how she started uh, doing what she does. Now, as I'm, I don't know if I've mentioned this in the episode, but Danielle is a pet behaviorist. She's going to tell you what that is and how she got started into it. And, um, and I'll, I'll let her take it from there. Um, basically, I am a cat and dog pet behaviorist whisperer. It took me a long time to own that, folks, because this is something I was born with. My mother um, was awesome because everything came to her, our house, cats, dogs, birds, everything. And then people started bringing their pets um, to the house for me, and I was little, but I always knew what to do, and it always worked before I had any type of formal training, and it was just something um, I call myself uh, Mrs. Doolittle because it is the truth, and the spiritual aspect of that, it took me a long time to own it because I was put down about it, I was made fun of, and it's real people. And then there are a lot of crazy folks in this uh, pet community that I, just to be frank, didn't want to be associated with. God bless them. But I always have a joke, Rodney. I tell my clients uh, when I meet them that this is not Ghost and I am not Whoopi Goldberg, okay? (laughs) (laughs) And that just lightens up the mood so people can take the spooky out of it and quit trying to make me come in there with crystals and all kind of things because I don't do that. Maybe somebody else does, but I don't. And I'm not a crystal ball. It happens when it happens, and when it does, it's awesome because it makes me very good at my job listening to these animals. And what happened was I am like a lot of you. I have a lot of uh, talents that I've been blessed with, and I've worked in all these different areas, always making my own money. I've been an entrepreneur since I got here. And I kind of just put this on the back burner, like Rodney said, because it was just something that I knew how to do. And I didn't really think about this was going to be my company or I was going to make an empire and make a name doing it. And what happened um, is I dream. And when I dream, my dreams mean things. And um, uh, 
They're not something that I just watched on television the night before. They're actually little nuggets from God. And I am one of those people I listen. And when I met Rodney, it was one of those um, nuggets. And he said, okay, I had a high-end event planning business. He said, you shouldn't be doing this. He said, this right here, this book is what I'm looking at, what you should be doing. I don't know what you plan to do, but this is what you should be doing. And then we um, started Bezos Corner, which was my cat at the time. And um, it was the website speaking from a pet's perspective. And um, it blew up. And the thing I want to tell all of you is there are no rules in how to go about this. I didn't know so I wasn't bound by the rules. I opened up with um, having events, and people came, and I learned how to put the butts in the seat. I had something to say. I didn't know that there weren't any cat and dog pet behaviorists. There is usually a cat or a dog trainer or a horse or a whisperer, but they're not all in one vein, and I am. And what basically happened was I blew up, okay? People were coming to me left and right and saying, where have you been? And I had to really get a structure under me to service these people. And um, for the life of me, I had to get really quiet before I did that because that can be overwhelming. Before I spent money, I went and took some time by myself just to hear and sometimes I say the best advice I can give anybody is to go and get quiet, and I call it letting the dust settle so you can get some clarity because other than that, you're all cerebral and brains are not storage devices. You'll burn out that way. And what I got was is to listen, to listen to people. Really simple, guys. That's it. Listen to people. What is it that I kept hearing over and over that people wanted? Um, what is it that they weren't saying? What is it that I saw that all the animals needed? And that's how I came up with this VFOs because I was doing it, and I didn't even know the name of it yet. And when I am just so clear that, the answer is there. It's usually so simple and right in front of your face that you're expecting it to be some cloud parting ah, epiphany or complicated, and it's not. You know, I am one that thoroughly believes that God wants us to succeed. He doesn't want us to fail. I really believe that there are in this world that is so complicated and the few that are loud and, and just awful, the majority is quiet, but they're awesome people. I still believe the majority of people are good people, and they, they hold their peace, and the ones that don't want to hold their peace are the ones that are the loudest, and they're usually obnoxious and just horrific, and you think that they're the majority because they're the loudest voice in the room and in your face, but it's not true. And if you can just give yourself a minute to be quiet, you will get the nuggets also. It's not a select few, okay? It's just that a select few learned how to listen. And I'm talking about making money. No woo-woo stuff here. I'm talking this is real. We're spiritual beings, you know. And what happened for me is that I just started to get bold about putting what I was listening into action. And the website was one. And then when I did the website, people started to come. And then I started to just really listen to them. You be quiet and let them talk. You will learn volumes that way. And what I saw, Rodney, do you want me to go this direction? You know, no, please do because... Okay, because what I saw was the door started opening for different people that served different purposes in my life. And some of them were mentors and some of them were just for a season. Some of them um, 
you know, we're all kind of people. I mean, when I met Rodney, I had just gotten my first computer in my life. He thought I was joking, but I was serious. But I'm a quick learner, especially if it's something I want to learn. And um, I land on my feet very well, and I pay attention, and I have good instincts. And what happened was each one of these awesome individuals just started, you know, to put this whole puzzle together where I could see this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And now I'm at the point of where I've built a pet community, over 6,000 loving pet parents that I didn't even know existed. I thought they were going to think I was crazy or whatever, but they're like, oh, my goodness, what? And um, I get paid very well, and I'm proud to say that because these people understand my worth. They understand that their pets are not a dog that you just put in the backyard on a chain. I even have it on the website that if you're of that particular mindset, you are not my client. You are not uh, my type of person. You and I are not going to see eye to eye, and it works. It vets them for me very, very well. This VFO is awesome. Um, So, Rodney, do you want me to talk about the VFO? Yes, in this series, I've been calling it or referring to it as the irresistible freebie. Some people refer to it as a lead magnet. Uh, you refer to it as a VFO. Can you explain to the listeners what a VFO is? Valuable free offer. Who doesn't like something for free, right? But what I've noticed is a lot of the free stuff is just crap, people. And, yes, I'm blunt. I can't help it, all right? I wanted to give value but I want to get paid. And um, the valuable free offer is what I do that has set me apart and made me so successful. It is a pet personality assessment. And what that is is whether you have a cat or a dog, um, it is specifically based on their personality. And I have uh, devised this test that I hadn't made public, but it is, shows you what personality type your pet is, and there's eight basic personalities. The most popular one uh, that the majority of people have is a social butterfly, but every once in a while you'll get a pet that is a couple of the personalities, but it's pretty rare. There are Einsteins, and there are sassy pants, and um, all different kinds of personalities that make up your pet, just like people. They have individual personalities. So when I come, I never work in generalities. I don't care what breed it is, even though there are some truths. You always have an individual in front of you. And I come with the mindset of respect and to listen. I'm listening to the owner, I'm listening to the pet, and I'm highly, highly, highly observant. And it's in your home. And um, you uh, take the VFO, which is on the website, and it gives you a little nugget into the insight of your pet. And it's very, very accurate. And I give a little training tip there. Now, why is this so important? Because it automatically shows you that I get you. And who doesn't want to work with somebody that gets them and their pet? When you feel like you have been heard and understood, you automatically act better. And this is the key to training pets. When they, they're very smart, people underestimate them all the time, their intelligence. But this test, when you find out the personality of your pet, there are secrets into training them, into communicating with them, into better understanding them. And once you know how to do that, it makes the process quick and fun in the, in the meantime. So this VFO kind of vets um, my pre-clients before they even call me. But by the time they call me, they're ready to sign up because they see that I understand them. And that is just priceless, I feel. 
So I'm going to pause because you know I'm a walking encyclopedia. So this is great. I want to put a little container around really what you're saying is that, again, you know, we're going to get into the technical, some somewhat of the technical aspects of it because it's not that much to actually what it, how to put the assessment together. What's really important before we start, before you get into that piece is what are you feeding into the assessment? And the only way, or the quiz, and the only way to really accurately do that is to um, get clear about what you do, how you serve the transformation, or what it is that you provide, and get really clear about that, and then be able to then know what questions to ask of the potential audience that you want to serve so that you can get clear on where they're coming from and what their where their language is, and more to the point, what results will excite them. Because as you begin to build out or construct your own assessment or quiz, that's going to be important to know that when they get that result, first of all, is it going to make them curious enough to even want to take the assessment? And then if they do it, is the result going to excite them enough to want to go further because they've gotten this first layer of whatever the result is that the assessment gave them? And so that was one of the things that I got out of this, which was really, really, really powerful. Now, as I said, I know that you did, you know, an illustrated book. But with that said, I want to ask this question. Out of all the VFOs or ir irresistible freebies, lead magnets that you could have created, why not have done perhaps an ebook where you just share this information or package it up as a mini course of some sort? Why an assessment or quiz over, say, an ebook or, say, a mini course? Why did you choose that? Because the main thing I was hearing was, who is this? Why are they acting like this? What's behind it? And uh, people were already um, so frustrated and um, exhausted from things that they had tried. I knew that they didn't have a lot of time. They didn't want to read anything. Um, they didn't want to um, spend a lot of time on the issue. They didn't want something that looked tedious. They wanted something simple. They wanted something to um, speak to them immediately, and they wanted um, instant gratification, and they wanted to have fun. Because everything, you know, if you got a cat or a dog peeing and pooping all over your house, you are at your wit's ends, and that's what I get. So I wanted to immediately tell them that they were in a safe place, that I was going to listen to them, that they're going to get a little uh, insight into me immediately before I even speak to them, that um, they're going to get some answers right after taking this VFO and it wasn't going to take a lot of their time, and it was going to make them laugh, and like, uh-huh, yeah, that's my fluffy, or that's my so-and-so, I'm calling this woman right now. And <laughs> that's what has happened, and um, it's it's been very, very good to me, very, very good to me. Um, and uh, the strategic part of it, because you know, Rodney, I'm very strategic, uh, it's been very, very good to me also. Okay, this is great. So this brings me to my next question, which I know a lot of listeners are listening uh, listening to. And I'm just going to throw this in right now. For anyone that wants to experience Danielle's assessment, uh, you can uh, catch that at Ask Danielle, D-A-N-I-E-L, with an E at the end, uh, Danielle, for the number four pets.com, and you can... Um, take the assessment to see. So this leads to the question I want to ask is, for someone that's thinking about creating their own assessment, I know that you said you have eight personality types that you constructed. And so when someone takes the assessment, they land on a particular, based on their, uh, their responses, they land on a particular personality type. So how did you construct that? How did you come up with the eight personalities or what have you? Um, how did you actually map that out? And for someone listening who wants to make some, type, some sort of an assessment, and this, let's assume that they aren't doing exactly what you're doing, but they they want to create something that maybe gives like a personality type or something of that nature. How would you recommend someone put that together or construct that? Well, how I did that was um, from observation. That's why I told you to go get quiet 
and listen more than you speak because um, I saw over and over again these types of pets that had certain behaviors with them. Um, For instance, the social butterfly is like people that are social butterflies. They're not afraid to meet anybody. They know how to approach them. They're very happy. They're very open. And so when I saw that, I knew that that was a personality that I was looking at for somebody else. Um, looking to do a VFO similar, what I would say is know the potential clients that you want to attract. So the worst thing in the world I think you could do is say something like, I'm a pet behaviorist, I work with everybody. That's not true. Um, You can put me in a room with 20 pet behaviorists and I promise you we're all going to be different. And so, therefore, that's why I have so much peace around it because I am not a competitive person and I really have no interest to be trying to compete with you and you should adopt that particular mindset for yourself because what you do, your genius work, is totally different than anybody else, I promise. That, number one, you need to understand. Number two, you need to, what they used to say, I don't know who said it first, get in where you fit in. What that means is where is your flow? What keeps coming up again and again that you could do in your sleep that's so easy for you because it's natural for you because you were born to do it? You don't even have to study to do it, really. Any study that you did just enhanced the foundation that you already had, that you already knew. This is how I would go about trying to find out the VFO that was best for me and my business and my talents is what is it that you do that people really, really need? What is it that you do? If you're a good listener, then you need to narrow it down even more, and you can do it in your small circle. You know, if you're a person that can be trusted, if you're a person that people go to when they're panicked, then you bring peace. If you're a person that, you know, is just a born teacher and you are good with teaching women that, you know, are overwhelmed, then you can put your VFO around something like that. I'm telling you, if you just go and get quiet and spend some time to listen to what is the common denominator that keeps coming in your face, that keeps happening in your life, just take a minute and look around. You'd be surprised how many people don't do that. There are some people that are trying to fit somebody else's shoes and these shoes don't fit that's why your success is minimal and i want to put this caveat onto what you just suggest you know suggested danielle on episode 16 i introduced 15 different vfos as you call them or irresistible freebies that you could you know you could do i mean an assessment being one of them but someone listening may discover that your particular situation won't necessarily benefit from a quiz or an assessment or it doesn't lead to one, lean to one. Uh, you may discover that, but then on the other hand, you may discover that an assessment could be just one of a very few of a few different v, VFOs or irresistible freebies that you do, that you have in your business. I know in your business, your pet assessment is one layer of how you serve your audience. So if you, you know, tell the listeners what happens after they get the results and how it transitions into some, some of them becoming paying clients. Get on the phone with me and book their session. Is it a paid session or, or a free session? It's paid always. I don't mm-hmm. show up without getting paid. Okay, so immediately after they complete their assessment, then they're redirected to a page where they can, where your phone number is available for them to set up a call with you, a short call with you, to do sort of a screening call. And that's a free call. Is that correct? Call. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I tell them what the results were. I mean, they tell me what the results were after they did the assessment. Mm-hmm. And then I listen. I listen because, trust me, they want to talk about their pet. Mm-hmm. And then after they finish talking, I let them talk for about a good five, ten minutes, and then I tell them 
what I'm going to do to resolve what is going on with them that they have been dealing with. So immediately what I do for my potential clients is I bring peace in their chaos because when they come to me, they have chaos. Now, I know the nature of your business is that you work with your clients locally, but since you have a website that can be seen anywhere, do you also make your clients available? Are you making yourself available to work with clients virtually? I do. Um, that has some limitations to it because there are some pet challenges I can't do that way. Okay. So after they call me, um, I can tell if, um, you know, which is going to be necessary for them. Okay. Okay. So based on what you just laid out, which I think is a great uh, part to be taking notes if you're list- as you're listening to this, so your quiz or your assessment, however you want to label it, is VFO1, and then that redirects the person who just took the assessment to VFO number two or irresistible freebie number two, which is to hop on the call for you, hop, hop on a call with you for a brief like 15 minute or so introductory um, screening call. And based on everything that you're laying out, and this is a, another reason why I, I really find a lot of value in what you've uh, basically put together is that every element of your, um, your freebie, if you will, or your VFO is centered around engagement. So an assessment is an engaged activity that the person taking it does in, you know, with you on your website And then that leads to a second layer of engagement, which is then them hopping on the phone with you. So what I love about what you've done is that it's not passive at all. It's all uh, very activity driven, which I think has a lot to do with why you've been so successful with it. Also, with this said, and this is something that I just had an observation about because I recently just did a a quiz or assessment uh, in a book that I was well, it was created by these book authors, and I did the assessment, and to be frank, I didn't really like the answer, so I did it again. But anyway, um, I did this assessment, and what I got out of it and what I liked about it was that it was, I was, again, involved. I was actively involved in getting an answer. Um, Again, what I what I find with say like a a more passive type, what I call a more passive type of a, a free offer is that it it, like I say, it is passive. Like reading a book or listening to an audio is passive. You can multi well with audio. You can multitask. With the book, you really have to read. So it maybe isn't as passive. But unless you're giving people actions to take, uh, again, it's sort of taking and taking an information. But the reader sometimes doesn't always take additional action to move forward uh, with you. And so what this brings up for me is what I hear so much in the internet marketing world uh, talks about so much as, you know, put out something of list, what they call list building freebie or lead magnet or whatever. And then once someone gets on your list and then you basically, you know, email them and email them and email them and, you know, do what they call nurture um, and just basically kind of keep after them for weeks or months and sometimes even years uh, before they take action. And, what I've seen what you do is, or that you don't do, you don't, you don't believe in that. You don't do that. You go right into taking action and continuing taking action by doing the assessment and getting on the phone with you. So you don't believe in that. No, you do not. And yes, I know I said that kind of forcefully, but no, you do not. That is not true. Maybe for some people it is, Mm -hmm. but one of the reasons I'm so passionate about this is because I was told you can't do this, you can't do this, you got to do this, you got to do that, and that's not true. The main thing that makes people buy is when they trust and they can relate to you and you give them comfort and you solve their problem. Now, the challenge is how can you give them an hors d'oeuvre of all of that with your VFO? I don't even, I send out my email once a month because that worked for me. And I have people 
that write me, and um, I've never met some of these people. They're in different states or even different countries, and they look forward to that email. One of the things that was tradition on the, in the on- online industry is that you have to blow up people's inboxes, and I don't like that. I don't like that being done to me, and I don't want to do that to somebody else. That, to me, makes me start deleting you and unsubscribing. I'm just speaking from my point of view. So I know how that made me feel, and I didn't want to come off that way because that is not my personality. You know, I do have a very strong um, business because to get the VFO, you have to give your email address. But I will tell you that I have a very low unsubscribe rate, I mean very, very low. And what that does and what that tells me that I'm very proud of, by the way, is that people are getting what they need. And isn't that why most of you on this call are here? You are here to be a leader in your industry. You are here to be of service and you are good at what you do. You just need some exposure. Is that not true? So this is what I'm trying to tell you. There are some, and we're not going to mention any names, going to keep it friendly, that are very aggressive, and that works for them. Now, that doesn't work for me, but you have to figure out what is the type of person that you are? If you are a person that works really good behind the scenes, then you might want to think about that because that's where you shine. And we all have different positions, and they're all brilliant. The worst thing you can do is try to force yourself into a category where you do not belong. Stay in your own category. Just find out with clarity what that category is. And the VFO doesn't have to be hard. Where I've seen the VFO become hard is when somebody is trying to live up to the image that they have, but the image that they have doesn't fit them. You understand what I mean? Right, right. Well, That's so important. Mm-hmm. And to add to that, I think our natural communication style plays a huge role in how we connect with our ideal audience and what we create to connect with them. For example, the person coming to your website is looking for an immediate solution to an issue they're experiencing, and your VFO does this by giving them some insight into their pet's personality, which affects their behavior, which feels like a quick win. And I think that's important. So for an example, another thing I want to add to that, I think if you're a natural writer, your ideal audience probably prefers to read. Or if you're a natural talker, then perhaps podcasting or presenting on stage may be your lane. Your ideal audience would probably enjoy listening to podcasts or attending conferences or live events. And so, that's what they call your tribe. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. So and I, you can build a thriving build a business on the people in your tribe. How do you know how big your tribe is. You don't know. Because I was told, oh, that's stupid. (laughs) Just to be blunt with you. And it was somebody close to me, okay? That's why I don't trust them all the time, okay? But I was told that's stupid. You can't, you've got to go sit under and partner with these people. And I'm like, well, I don't like how they're training animals, and I don't agree with them. And, you know, not to get all egotistical, but I'm like, okay, I don't feel good at all about doing that they're like well you can't do this because nobody knows you and you can't do this because um you know it doesn't work that way you have to do this do that and other and you know all that did was make me dig in deeper and uh, now they're asking me what did you do and i'm like i listened Mm -hmm. you know i didn't i didn't agree with that bullying technique and I teach alpha training but it's not you know you get people and animals to do anything when you're they're afraid of you but I don't like that that is not who I am right so you have to be true to yourself you know what I mean 
And the other thing I want to add to that, just to add to what you just said, is that I want to address what you mentioned is listening. You know, there's two parts to that. There's listening to yourself and there's also listening to your audience so that you can begin to get clarity before you start creating whatever it is that you're going to create. Uh, something I want to also add here, as, I, as we're talking about this particular piece of it, as I mentioned, you know, last in last episode, episode 16, I introduced the 15 different uh, irresistible freebies or, or VFOs, assessments being one of them. But I want to also make sure I say this at this point of the conversation is that I think it's important not to get so caught up in what the actual thing is going to be. I think that's important, obviously, to look at the options that you have. But this, what we're talking about now, what Danielle and I are talking about now is really the key component. It's got to be rooted in something that is based on information, communication, research, asking questions, getting clarity, and being able to know exactly what your person, your tribe, as Daniel put it, is looking for so that whatever you end up creating ends up feeling, as she puts it, valuable. It has to feel valuable to them. And so I feel like you get that when you spent the time really communicating directly. And for a lot of listeners who may be working strictly online, I feel like that, you, of course, you know, you can do this in a myriad of different ways, but what something I want to ask, um, ask Danielle in a moment is getting in front of your people. I always think that, you know, doing things over the internet or by phone is fine and great. We have Skype and all these wonderful tools, but I think you always seem to get a little bit deeper, get a little bit more, information from people when you can get in front of them in person. And I know that, um, you know, Danielle, you know, you did in the very beginning when you were promoting Bejo's Corner, you did a lot of in-person live events, which put you in direct contact with your audience. Can you talk about that a little bit? When you put the right information out there, they will find you. But you have to put it out there. You have to go where you know they are. I can tell you the kind of client that I service best. I can tell you about the range of age they are, how much money they make, where they live, if they're in a house or an apartment. It's gotten that succinct. And I say that um, there are far more of them than I had any idea. Before you start to... um, pay for, um, you know, all these tools that they have, which Rodney, I know you are aware of, they have so many, it's overwhelming, is I would do a little research, who exactly are you a perfect fit for? Where do they hang out? What do they like to do? Why would they buy something from you? How can you offer something to make them say, I need that, that's a perfect fit for me? This is my person. These are really key, you know, marketing questions that I think you need to understand. As I said a few minutes ago, I don't service anybody. Can I train anything? Oh, yes, I could. But it would be a disservice to the person that that really is their calling. The people that I know are mine, they... um, are going to be um, attracted to a specific language that is going to resonate with them, to bring comfort, to bring, oh, she gets me, to bring, she can fix this. Where have you been? I've been asked that question so many times. I'm like, why do people keep asking me, where have you been? I'm like, I've been right here. But it let me know that there were more people out there that needed what I had, just like whoever is on this call and listening, there are people out there that need specifically what you have. So if you're looking to build this business and you're just thinking about money, you've already lost. Mm -hmm. People are very, very in tune to that. Um, Be sincere you will go far. That's what I will say. Be sincere. You will go far. 
it will happen for you if you're consistent you do the work and you are sincere i promise your business is going to grow you know as you said danielle there's so much power in listening uh right now i've been taking the uh, course with Marie Forleo called Copy Cure. I've been learning how to get it. Oh, I love her. Mm-hmm. Copy. And one of the biggest takeaways I've gotten from taking this program with Marie is that it's it's really emphasized and taught me that, you know, as um, a communicator, you know, uh, in this context, copywriter, we don't really write anything. I mean, yes, we put the words on the page, but a lot of the language and things that we use to communicate is talking to the person that we're communicating to. We're basically mirroring back what they're saying, their issues, their concerns, their problems, whatever it is that's keeping them up at night. We're communicating that back to them. So what I really learned is that um, with taking the Copy Cure program is that you will get much more out of your uh, communication with the audience you want to work with by spending time interviewing them, listening to them, as you, you've been saying all of this time, once you get that information, it makes it so much, it makes what you put out there, no matter what form it is, so much more connect, uh, so much more relatable to the person that is actually going to be consuming whatever it is that you put out there. So I love that. So with that said, I think the best piece of advice I can give you is interview your people, listen to your people. Exactly. Yes. For example, go to places like Amazon and read book reviews and not just focus on the quote unquote good or the five star reviews, but uh, look for the the one star, two star, three star reviews and see what people are writing. See what people are saying, because that's where it's going to help give you information as to what issues uh, that person is wanting that book that they went looking for to address. So there's a lot of gold in Amazon reviews. Another area that I've been recommending is, uh, especially if you're thinking about creating courses, check out things like online platforms like Udemy and Skillshare and read the reviews of the courses. Look at what people are talking about, what their issue was, why they signed up for the course, where they felt the course uh, excelled and more to the point where it probably would possibly failed them because that's going to give you a lot of intel as to what's going on in people's heads and what they're looking for and what what's out there that's not addressing the need that they have because that helps you figure out what you need to do to help fulfill the need they're not getting outside because honestly here is the core fund fundamental truth the things that the people are complaining about, they're fussing about, the things that they're unhappy about is really where you, we all have the opportunity to create something that will solve that for them. It's not in the things necessarily that make us happy. It's in the things that we're frustrated behind is where our opportunities as creatives really get to step in. So again, you want to look for, you want to seek out where the issues are where the frustrations are. And again, you know, of course, you always go, you always, I think, get some of the best intel when you can speak with people directly. But until you can build up to that, I always recommend start out with some of the review sites, either Amazon or whatever, uh, like I sell Skillshare, Udemy, whatever, what have you. <clears throat> That's a good place to start. Again, because again, we're all in some form of a problem solving business or we are in helping someone fulfill a desire business. And even in order to get that desire met, we still sometimes have to overcome an issue in order to get that desire met. So as I said in episode number 15 of this series, I said people want to know that you, they, they, want, they want you to know that what the issue is that they have, what their dream is, what it is that they want, and where your opportunity comes in is what can you do to help them get it? So what's the desire or the problem that they have or, or what's the desire that they have really? And then the issue is what's standing in the way of them getting it and how can you serve them to help them get it? That's where your opportunity lies. So again, if you can meet people where they are, um, if you can meet them where they are based on the conversation that's going on in their head, and you can mirror that back to them through your irresistible freebie and or VFO and the content that you create that follows up behind that, whatever that may end up being. When you 
when you can dial it in that that succinctly where that person automatically reads what you say because again it's their words not what you're making up but you're mirroring back their words uh, that you're able to communicate that with them so that that first introduction with that with that uh, irresistible offer that free offer that first taste with you that's already calling them out it's essentially waving a flag and saying you who this if you have this issue here I have a potential solution for you. That captures the attention to begin with. Then once they opt in, they give you their contact information and get on your email list, then that's when you continue to address what they opted in for in the first place by continuing to follow up with them is how you will shorten, I believe, shorten that time between when they opt in for your list and when they actually take action to do something in terms of possibly working with you because you've shortened that gap between when they opted in and the solution that you provide. Like what Danielle does, she offers the, the, the assessment. The assessment immediately moves right into an opportunity to get on the phone with her. There's no months and months and months of nurturing, sending out emails and that kind of thing. So you want to shorten that gap. You want to close it up so that, again, there is, there is introduction, solve a problem, introduce the next problem, solve that problem, and then continue the conversation. So you, what you want to avoid is to have a list of people who don't do anything. And there's a couple of ways that can happen. One is to not provide any solution or not speak. Really dive under the hood to the issue that your new subscriber is experiencing. So in order to fill your list with buy-ready people, you've got to call out the issue that they are addressed, they're needing answers to, Give them something that addresses that and then offer the next win, the next small win. As you continue to do that, your listener, your reader, whoever it is, will then naturally want to do the next step because they feel like you get them and you hear them. The biggest joke that I heard of, I mean, they, they got such a bad rap. They, I wonder if they stopped doing this, whereas you could buy people to join your, um, your list. And I'm thinking, well, who in the heck wants to do that? Just get a bunch of emails, you know, they don't know you. You're just going to get unsubscribes everywhere and just piss a lot of people off. You know, <laughs> that's well, what I think. <laughs> well, and because I've been working in the Internet marketing realm, as you well know, for many years, I know exactly yeah. where that mentality comes from is because we hear this over and over and over and over again is that the money's in the list, the money's in the list, the money's in the list. And so when you keep hearing that, you think, okay, well, if the money's in the list, then I'm willing to put up some money to basically buy my list. Uh-huh. But what, yeah. but what people are now starting to get, and, you know, I've dabbled, as you, you and I both well know, I worked with you to help you build up your Facebook page. And mm -hmm. you actually, mm -hmm. you know, did Facebook ads mm -hmm. to build up your page. But one, you didn't spend a whole lot of money. One. No. You, you actually tell them, Rodney, tell them what happened. Cause you're like, Danielle, this thing is blowing up. And it blew up in Texas, of all places. Who knew? So what Danielle and I are talking about here is when I first started working with Danielle at this level, we were, she had already built up a Facebook page. She'd had someone working with her that was helping her with her Facebook page. And it was kind of slow going. It wasn't that much happening. She had about 200 people that actually liked the page, sort of engaged with the page. And so when I looked at the page, I immediately went into asking her, well, who are the people that has the ear of the audience that you want to attract. And she told me. And so I set up what is considered now not popular, which is called a Facebook like campaign. But that's what we did at the time was a Facebook like campaign. So it was to get people who shared a similar audience interest to be, to be become aware of her page, her Facebook page. And uh, we did a like campaign to get them over to pay attention to Danielle's page and so, again, when we started working with it, it was roughly around 200 or so people following it. And I think within, like, less than two weeks, we got up to 6,000 likes on the page. And these are very engaged, extremely engaged people that actually really follow and comment and share and like every post 
that she does. So what I say to that is your audience is out there and that's another layer to connect with them on. But the core, the, 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 the core foundation piece in this here is this becoming aware of who your audience pays attention to in order for you to get the information and tell that you need in order to be able to attract them over to your page because the audience exists. And if the audience doesn't exist, that could be a red flag for you that you need to keep researching until you find similar audiences. So again, like I said, I believe that we did it in like a little less than, um, a little less than two weeks. We basically. No, not even. It was 48 hours which like 20 X, um, I don't even know from 200 to five, 6,000, what that, what that number would be, how much that X the size of the page list. Now here is why I feel like Facebook pages are so important. One, <clears throat> excuse me, one, by following other people's Facebook pages that again, your target audience could be potentially paying attention to, uh, or they are paying attention to, you can also, you, you, you'll you instantly know when you look at the page if people are engaged with the content, how many people, not just the number of people following the page or liking the page, but are they commenting on the post? More to the point, what, what post are they commenting on? What post are they paying the most attention to? Because again, and not only what they're paying attention to, but what are they saying in the comments? Because again, that's intel for you that you can use to then craft your own offers uh, content that you create to then appeal to them as well. It's like a, a continuation of the conversation on your page. So again, um, I know there's a lot of talk or I don't know if you will controversy about like campaigns and Facebook like campaigns to get people to like your page. I'm not advocating or dissuading against doing that. That's what we did for Danielle, but I can say, um, Checking out other people or what I would construe as your com potential competition can give you a lot of valuable advice and intel on what you can put on your page. And again, how you attract them over to yours. There's a myriad of ways to do that. It could be a like campaign, which I know is not very popular right now in the Internet marketing world. Or you can do you know, other types of campaigns to get people who like who share a similar interest to also potentially be interested in what you're doing. And another thing that Danielle, at least I think she used to do, I don't know if you still do that. Do you still publish your newsletter on your page? Yeah, it's there now. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I have you... people calling me, uh, private messaging me. It's very, very active. And I guess Facebook started this, your top fans, and mm -hmm. they are just, I mean, it's amazing. I know their families and, and everything. I'm like, wow, you know, I have never met these people. So it's, it's I, I think that it's still a very valid way to go. So something I want to share here, and I want to be really a little blunt here in this in this context, is that size doesn't really matter. Quality always supersedes quantity especially in the in what we're talking about that, that's why i chose the focus of this podcast interview to be how to create and build a buy ready list not just a large list there's a lot of information out there a lot of teachings out there especially in the online marketing space that it's all about having a big list and yes numbers do matter in the context that a certain percentage of your list, no matter how, whatever size your list is, only a certain percentage of it is going to actually engage, meaning they're going to actually open your emails, read your emails, click through to things, and ultimately purchase. So in in that respect, you need to have some size of a list, but this this mindset that you've got to have a big list, meaning thousands and thousands and thousands of names, and that potentially, possibly investing thousands of dollars in Facebook ads in order to get that list, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm not talking down Facebook ads. But I want to be clear that quality and the quality of your communication with that list supersedes the quantity of the list. And I'm going to even go so far as to say this because there are people out there like Danielle who have lists under 1,000. 
and she does a very good business. So to me, I, I always go back when people say, well, I need to have a big list. Or I need to grow my list. Well, to me, the question I have to ask is, well, what is a big list? What does that mean? True. That's somebody, very, very true. You know, for some, it could be 100. It could be 500. For some, it could be 5,000. You, you, you yourself have to ask yourself, what does that mean for you? I would say instead of trying to get a big list, how active is your list? Mm -hmm. Say if you have 300 people there and you're sending out your emails and at least 50% of them open it and are talking to you and are converting into paying clients, I would think that that is far better than just having thousands on your email list that are just there and don't even open what you're trying to send. If you feel comfortable sharing, what's the size of your list now? It's small. You're not, you're, I just, I'm telling you. I have um, over 500 and something, but they're very active. It's like I sent out my email today, and I can promise you that um, at least 50% of them are going to open it. And um, the thing I love best, I think the thing I'm most proud of, is that they have stayed on my list for years and that they tell their friends and they have stayed clients for years. I have a client base now over 200 people. And I didn't want thousands upon thousands of clients. I've always told you that. I wanted um, these clients that were going to stay with me for the life of their pet. And it's something they needed for their pet. I wanted to be the one in the front of their mind as the solution for what they needed. And that has been um, the blessing for me. That's what I wanted. I didn't want to be overwhelmed and working 24 hours a day. I, I'm just not a workaholic like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wanted to build relationships with these people. And that's it. That's it right there. That's where your freedom is. That's where you, that's a tweetable. You don't want just a, a large list. You want a relationship with your list because that really is where all of this that we're talking about comes together. To me, that's where your freedom is. And your joy. Right, and your joy is. That's really, you want to have fun with what you're doing. You want to enjoy what you're doing. And so, yeah, your joy is very important. This is what the deal is. I mean, why I created this entire series, you know, of course, you know, this building is the crux of what we're talking about here. With that said, you're going to need something to put in front of people to get them to join your list. As Danielle puts it, a VFO, valuable free offer, I call it irresistible freebie. I don't necessarily want to get caught up in semantics about what the word is. The The main point I want to get across here and why I've created this series is that, yes, we want to grow our list. We want to get our list, you know, want to get people on our list. But more important than just getting a list or putting an offer in front of people to get them to, get them to join our list, we want to make sure that we're getting the right People. There you go. And that's what this is important. This is where all of this comes together. And keep in mind that not everyone that's going to opt in for your offer is going to be a buyer. Many, some people that will potentially be buyers, you may not want them to be buyers because they, you know, you can, they might not be 100% right fit. But you want to up the ante in your favor that they could be a good fit for you. So, again, not everyone that's going to join your list is going to buy something from you. And we all know that. That's just, you know, common sense, basically. But, again, what you want to do in order to, again, increase the odds in your favor that you will attract the right buyer. And it all comes down to basically these steps. One, you want to put the right offer. You want, well, you want to solve the right problem. That's the first thing. You want to create the right offer that solves the right problem or addresses the greatest desire. And then you want to put that right offer in front of the right person. And then once they're on your list, you want to communicate with them in the right way. But you want to communicate them in a way that encourages momentum and action because... As I mentioned a moment ago, 
uh, what I found so many people do in the internet marketing space is that someone opts in for your offer and then they immediately get redirected to what I would call a dead thank you page. And what I mean by that is a page where there's no additional action to take to deepen the relationship or there's too many actions to take. So the person doesn't really know exactly what to do because you're giving them too many options. So one action to take after they opt in for the thing that they've asked for. Now, what, what I call a dead thank you page is essentially that, you know, someone opts in, you get to redirect it to a thank you page that essentially says the thing that you requested is on the way to you, check your inbox, and then that's it. There's no invitation to go further with you. Uh, now, Danielle, in her case, she uses a 10 or 15 minute uh, call in order to be able to take that relationship that's already been started or that momentum that's been started from her quiz. And we're going to talk about her quiz in more detail in a moment. But she starts the relationship and the conversation and the momentum with the quiz. And then now that they've gotten this diagnosis, if you will, or this this bit of clarity, then she then extends the invitation to go into having the 10 or 15 minute phone call with with someone. Now, let me ask you this, Danielle. What else would you recommend, let's say, if you don't do a phone call? What else would you recommend other than a phone call after someone opts in for your freebie? For me personally or for mm-hmm. just your audience? Yes, just the audience because, again, you know, you do a service-based business, but not everyone listening does service-based businesses. Some do products, product-based businesses. Uh, I believe in Episode 7 it was I had entrepreneur Jane Button on the show. I'll put her link inside the show notes. And she started her business knitting baby hats and she's grown to a seven figure business now uh, doing so she works with crafters and, you know, home crafters and, and, and that that's her audience. And she's now created training programs that she uses to assist uh, crafters in starting their own uh, business uh, selling to retail. And so for someone like that who maybe sells a product-based business, um, you know, and maybe I'm putting you on the spot here, but um, what would you recommend for someone who does a product-based business and not a service-based business? What could be the next step? What could be something that they could offer after they opt in for the uh, valuable uh, free offer, the VFO? Um, The next step I would do is um, offer them some viable resources that she has handpicked so they don't just have to go into the sea of resources that this one will work for you because of this, this one will work for you because of this. If you're doing that, then this will work for you because of this. Because a lot of times there's so much information out there that you would love to glean from the expert the ones that have been handpicked and selected that they know that will work and better than that, that they use themselves. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's what I would do yeah. because so, they're going to need those resources, to whatever they're trying to create. Yeah. Yep. I like that a lot. I love that a list of resources. And if you're a teacher like myself or like Jane, for an example, you know, to me, I like something that gives a little bit more engagement or emphasizes more engagement. So I think something like, you know, potentially a Facebook group could be a great next step. Yeah, people love that stuff. So you could do something like a Facebook group and like a weekly open office hours in the Facebook group is always a good option to consider uh, where you can get their questions answered. You can schedule. I'm in a group right now where the uh, coach offers a weekly open office hours. Uh, You can run that. You can do it through a tool like Zoom or you can do it through Facebook Live. I think Zoom is getting really popular. I'll make sure to add that in the show notes as well. So a weekly open off, open office hours where they can get their questions answered. And then if you offer some kind of a, you know, course like Jane does or, you know, a membership program or something like that, you can extend an invitation to then join your paid group or your paid area. That's something that you could consider. The other thing I want to make sure I emphasize, too, because, again, the invitation to join this page or this group or what have you would come again on the thank you page. So as I said a moment ago, it's really important that on your thank you page where they're redirected after they opt in for your VFO or freebie, that you're really only giving them one action to take. In the internet marketing world, I've seen a lot of people do this because I've studied internet marketing all the time and I'm a, I've am done this myself because I've studied what other people do. 
but I've seen where, you know, there's a video there to, uh, again, you know, make sure that they um, whitelist you so that your, that your emails don't go to spam. And then there's an action on there to join your Instagram page and an action to join your Facebook group and to like your Facebook page and, you know, and, and then download the thing that you offered them when they opted in the first place. And you're giving people too many things to do on the page. And so the likelihood is that they'll click away and may not do anything. Just give them one action to take, the one that's the primary action you want them to take. Obviously acknowledge that they're getting the thing that you they've opted in for. Let them know that's being sent to their inbox. Give them a time frame so they'll know what to look for. But then give them one action. So join your Facebook group or maybe take or maybe there's a one question quiz or like Danielle does hop on the phone and have a one on one conversation with you. But don't bombard them with too many actions to take on the thank you page, because, again, that's a way to lose them. And you want to take a next step that increases engagement, not overwhelms them where they take no action at all. Yep. Yep. Keep it simple. So taking these actions and taking these steps is what's going to make your your irresistible freebie or your VFO so valuable for the person who's subscribing to your list. You're just moving them closer to becoming a customer by setting it up the right way by educating them and then again engaging engagement is everything so if you the more that you can engage them the greater the chances are that they will move towards wanting to work with you so that's really the core crutz of why you want to put together something that's valuable for them and to get them engaged in your world now i want to take a take a little different take here or take a different direction here for a moment and talk about uh, what exactly you did, Danielle, to actually put together your your assessment or your quiz? Like, what tool did you use? Um, I do believe um, I use Viral Quiz Builder. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I connected that uh, to the lead pages, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, which goes directly back to my list, so they get to check it out and do some things. So only two tools, lead pages, which I love. I love lead pages. I use them all the time. And a viral quiz builder, the links to both of those are inside the show notes. So I'll put all of that in all of that in the show notes there, which you can get at getpaidforyourcreativity.com forward slash 017 for episode 17. So again, only two tools that you use. Now, what exactly you put in your quiz that really isn't a question that either myself or Danielle can really answer for you. Where you will determine what goes actually goes in your quiz is really based on your research. And again, your you know talking to your customers, talking to your potential customers, the people that you want to attract, finding out what's really going to excite them and what they really would be curious about. Because curiosity really is the thing that feeds all types of assessments or quizzes. Uh, in the case of what Danielle does, you know, you do a, a pet personality assessment. And I think all of us, you know, are curious about personality types and that kind of thing. So there could be personality types that you create. And again, you can create this. You don't have to have a, a book telling you to do this. But we all kind of know what kind of uh, personalities our customers or potential customers possess. And so it could be something like that. But again, that's not really what we can tell you here. Again, you really need to do your research and really talk to your people to find out what's really going to work best for you, what's going to go in the quiz. No, you need to know what um, is the common denominator with the people you're trying to serve or attract and sell your product to. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. they all have one, I promise. You just got to go get quiet somewhere and observe and listen. They all are saying the same thing. I promise. You know, as you were talking, it made me think of something, and this is something where you could really have some fun, something similar. This could maybe inspire you. I remember a few years ago I had a consult with a potential client who was a hat designer. And what popped into my head at the time, and I told her this, I said, you know, you should really consider going uh, and checking out black churches. Yes, they call them crowns. Right, they call them crowns. And I remember in our conversation, she lives somewhere back east. I don't remember where, I think Connecticut or something like that. 
And um, I said, you know, are there any black churches in your area? I said, if there are, I says, you know, she says, I'm sure there are. And I says, you should go check those out, I says, because I think there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of information for you there. You know, a lot of good potential customers for you there, too. That's a good field trip for her. Ooh, I love that. That's a good idea. Take notes on that, people. Take a field trip. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good field. Who doesn't like a field trip that'll bring you back to school and nostalgia? Yeah, it's good. You know, and by hanging out with the women and spending time with the women and I'm sure observing them and having conversations with them, I feel very intuitively that you're going to see personalities emerge that you can definitely kind of put together as some kind of a quiz or assessment. That's Ooh. true. Yes, I agree. You know, and if she put together some kind of a quiz or assessment that was titled something like, what's your hat personality? I have no doubt that those women would take a quiz or assessment like that, you know? That's a that's a really good um, title there. Yeah, so like, what's your hat personality? You know, at the end of the day, I just want to really just clarify this here. You know, Danielle works with pet dogs and cats. Uh, in the case of the example I used here, this uh, person was a hat designer. At the end of the day, it really doesn't matter what what or who you work with. At the end of the day, we're all people, and we all have personalities. Would you agree? Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? That's true. You know, so as I said a moment, you know, we there, we all possess a personality. Every human being has a personality. What's really important here is that you get into the space of observing people because those personalities will emerge. You'll see them. They'll, 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 they will appear before you. I mean, you can be in any situation. You can be, you know, it, it's not about, in Danielle's case, a pet assessment. She studied and was a student of watching pet behavior which then allowed her to be able to then come up with the personality types that she formulated into her quiz. But that you could take that and apply that same mentality or that same mindset or that same strategy to anything. Like I just mentioned the story about the hat designer. She could get zero in on her ideal customer or client or market and then start to study and notice and observe what personalities emerge for the different types of hat wearers and styles and the things they like to buy. So again, in any situation, you can see those. If, if you're thinking about doing an assessment or quiz and you want it to be personality driven, the point I want to make here is that you can do that by observing and getting in contact and communication and conversation with the people that you most want to serve so that those those nuggets will appear before you that you can then label with personality types and then possibly use as a part of your quiz or assessment. And and really, you know, I know you've told these people this, but be honest. Mm -hmm. I don't know why you, that sounds so uh, simple, but it's not. Um, people, a lot of times, I think the image that, they have in their minds of what they're trying to create goes against the grain of where their secret sauce is for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For example, um, I have clients that are what somebody would call lost causes, the majority of them. This cannot be fixed, and that seems to be my specialty. Mm. And I think that some people listening right now have some of that but because there's fear around that they're going well I want to do this I want to do something that's easier or that's more sexy or this that, and the other and that may not be where your expertise is that may not be where your secret sauce is so at the end of the day this is what I just want to emphasize here is and Danielle and I have had numerous conversations about this is that there is no one size fits all type of a situation. You should, you know what? You should engrave that somewhere. <laughs> I probably. Should. It I is that big of a truth yeah. that that should be, you know people need to stop thinking that way. Yeah, you know, I mean, there, it, it, you know, to be really blunt and literal, like even in clothing, there is no such thing as one size fits all. I mean, the same dress that would 
someone who let's say is anorexic would not be the same size dress that someone who weighs 600 pounds would be able to wear so you know we get into these sort of catch-all phrases that sound I don't know uh, sexy or easy or simple to say but just like there's no one size fits all anything in clothing, there's no one size fits all with your marketing. There's no one size fits all with how you relate to an audience. You're going to relate to your audience different than someone else. Someone who does something similar to what I do is going to relate to their audience differently than what I will and vice versa. So again, when we start owning our uniqueness and start looking for different ways to express ourselves but that are unique to us I feel like the better success that we have so for an example if you've been struggling to get your your VFO to be an ebook or something like that and you've been struggling to get that book out there maybe that's not what you should be doing maybe a quiz or an assessment is really more going to be a fit for you just as an idea to think about. So again, it's important that you, as Daniel has been saying throughout the entire podcast, is to drop in and get quiet and listen to yourself because you'll get the reveals and the insights about what to create next based on you're giving yourself that space to be able to, to get clear about what your next moves are. And one more thing I want to say, keep things fun. Yes. Really simple. You remember that movie, Ferris Bueller, Uh Day Off or whatever? Yeah, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Okay. Well, somebody, you know, I use this a lot. And the person, I don't remember his name, but he was such a dry teacher. And the kids, like, they're going into a kind of a coma while he was teaching. And he had this voice, and he kept saying, Bueller, Bueller. That's what... (laughs) Reminds me of something dry, boring, tedious, time-consuming. Nobody wants that. (laughs) And here is where the real deal is. You know, what's what's really important is that once they get them on, once you get someone on your list, what's vital is that you immediately do things to increase engagement immediately to keep them on what I call momentum going. Once someone has taken action, giving you their name and email address, whatever contact information you ask for, once they get to that next page, what's that next ask, that next layer? And so by being able to have a plan for that, you keep that momentum going. The longer that they're on your list and they they're, they fall further and further back, they, they open less. I recently did an audit for one of my clients, and she had subscribers on her list that hadn't opened an email in four years. That's a whole other conversation for a whole other podcast on list hygiene and cleaning out your list. But that that amount of people, again, this is why I'm so big about not having – or getting out of this mindset about having a big list because you can actually having a large list and not just a large list, but a list of people who don't open actually hurts your open rate overall. So if you've got someone on your list or a bunch of people on your list that haven't opened an email or engaged with an email in years, that actually affects what's called your bounce rate. And I know I'm kind of going off onto a technical tangent here, so I'm not going to stay on this. But I just wanted to let you know as we're talking about this, and I will do this for a future episode, is talking about list hygiene. It's important to remove those people because they're actually costing you money to have them on your service provider that you're using, whoever that may be, to host those names. But also by having them on the list, uh, like that and they're not opening, they're affecting the the deliverability of your emails overall. So you actually, once you do a list audit and clean your list up, if you have too many names on your list that are non-opens on a regular basis, you will notice your open rate go up. So that's, again, why so small and steady and consistent is really important. Now, something that I want to just say really quick to Danielle, um, you know, to you is... is um, Did you know that the average open rate and what you're doing is really quite extraordinary because your open rates, as you've already said, is way higher. But uh, the average open rate for email for open rate for newsletters is like, I think, 10 to 20 percent. Did you know that? Actually, I do. 
See, and I didn't even know that. I'm just like, oh, I want the whole thing. And I remember, I don't know, it wasn't you. It was so many years ago. They're like, are you crazy, woman? Do you know? <laughs> Do you know what you're doing? And I was like, no, I don't. You know, I was just doing my thing. And they're like, people are reading this stuff. They're really reading it. Listen, people have an attention um, span of a teetsy fly, meaning you got five seconds. If that. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> That's true. You got to grab them and you got to keep them. And there's so much coming at them and the kids are screaming, the husband or whatever your house is like. And you got to get through all that. <laughs> so it's got to be something good and juicy. Okay. <laughs> so in essence, your message, your you know, our emails that we send out to our list our, our messages, really, whether it's email to our list or posts we do on social media, it has to serve as some sort of a pattern interrupt because there's so much vying for our attention between what's going on in our lives personally, not to mention that many of us consume content on a mobile device. So if there's a notification that comes in or a text message or a phone call, you know, that we're bombarded with constant distractions. So it becomes really important that what we do in order to keep and maintain the attention of the people that we are working so hard to get on our list and so forth. Um, we have to be able to put messaging in front of them that interrupts the pattern uh, that gets them to think a little differently so that they begin to first pay attention because in reality, you know, our open rates on emails, I believe, like I said earlier, are around 10 to 12%. I was told 12% is the average. Yeah, right. 12% is probably about the average, but again, I have found in my experience that I'm seeing around a 20 to 25 percent on average. But again, that those numbers come down to subject lines. It comes down to the relationship, as we've mentioned earlier, with the content or the audience that you have. It comes down to you dialing in the messaging, dialing in the issues, the concerns, the things that your potential client wants, and being able to position in a way that they look forward to hearing from you. You're unique in that respect because, again, you do have an audience that lends itself to wanting to know more about the topic that you write about and that you give information about. But so that has a long way to, has a lot to do with it. But again, you want to be able to, you know, well, that's what, what I want to say to you is that what you've done is extraordinary because, again, it, you are able to really capture their attention in a way that they look for and they're eager to get messages and content from you, which is the space we all want to be in. We want our audience to look for it, to hearing from us, not to see our messages and sort of like, okay, whatever, I'll look at this later or feel annoyed by it. So you've done a really, you know, and because you've been strategic in your list building efforts and you've focused more on quality over quantity, you've put yourself in a really good position where you can pivot easy, easily or easily if you need to, which is really important no matter what stage of your business that you're in, but especially if you're in those beginning stages, being able to pivot uh, messaging, pivot audience, pivot topic, pick, pivot focus becomes really important. And so I think that that's one of the major benefits that a lot of us who focus on numbers and having a big list have a harder time doing because we feel like, especially if you've been doing Facebook ads or you feel like I've invested all this money in building up this audience only to find out that this is an audience I even want to work with. So that has a lot to do with, I think, the, the, the beauty of intentionally being strategic and building slowly as opposed to trying to build a big list fast. And one last thing I want to say on this subject, again, because we're kind of segueing a little bit into sort of more of the um, the email marketing sides of things, which I'm going to talk about that more in future episodes. But the one thing I did want to say, since we're on the subject of creating a list, which is why we're making a valuable free offer or irresistible freebie, um, is something that a lot of people don't know or don't think about. Again, this goes back into focusing on quantity over quality. One of the things that actually having a larger list that is not engaged with your content can work against you. And I this really became more apparent in the last few years since uh, uh, Gmail or Google uh, started categorizing the type of messages and how our messages are being delivered to us. What some people may not know is that Google 
or I'm sure Yahoo probably does the same thing and other uh, providers, they have algorithms, the same as we know about a Facebook algorithm or Instagram algorithm. The email service providers have algorithms as well. And what that means is when our emails are being sent out through a broadcasting service like AWeber or ConvertKit or Constant Contact or MailChimp or whoever, whomever we're using, when those emails are delivered in considered bulk or mass, those emails are over time being checked, if you will, for deliverability. Not just deliverability, but also engagement and or opening. So if you're, let's say if you have a thousand email addresses and you're emailing out every single week, something new, and I would say on average that 10 to 20% is opening the emails every single week. So I'm going to say 100 to 200 people are reading those emails every week. That's fine, but the service providers are also looking at the other 900 to an eight to 900 who don't open emails or rarely open emails or never open emails. And so that non open, as far as those services goes, looks at that this is a list, this is a potential uh, distributor or publisher, which in this case, you are, we are the publisher. There's not a lot of interest in this. Now, this gets gets into a whole other subject matter, which I'm not going to get into completely in this particular podcast episode. But uh, there is a thing called list hygiene where it's important to go through your list and delete emails or delete subscribers who are not engaging with your content. Um, just, you know, quick a little note, side note. I have a client I do this for. I just did a massive clean out for her list. We had subscribers on the list that hadn't opened an email in four years. So that affects de deliverability. So when you do uh, at least every six months, you should do a, cl uh, a clean out of your list in order to be able to remove names of people who are not engaging. There is a thing called a re-engagement campaign that you can do to uh, hopefully reinvigorate some of those subscribers. But if you can't do that, it's actually a good thing to delete those email addresses because they are affecting your deliverability rate. That's the first thing. And the second thing, because these email list services that we use to distribute our emails, we pay for those services. And so the more numbers, the more the bigger the quote unquote list is, you're paying to have those people on your list. You're paying for them. So if they aren't ever seeing your emails because they're ignoring them, not only are they costing you money because you're paying to have them on your list, but they're also costing you opens because your deliverability starts to go down. So again, this is another topic for a whole other podcast episode, which I'll do in future, but that's just something to think about as you are growing your list. So again, I really can't emphasize this enough. Quality always over quantity. Engagement always over just mailing for the sake of mailing will always go a long way towards growing a list of buy ready leads. So as I was saying, you know, to Danielle, when you are smaller, you can test and you can pivot easier. That's why to me, it's not surprising that you get a 50% open rate because your list is smaller, but your engagement is also higher. So because your engagement is higher, you're getting a higher click through rate. And so it, those numbers don't surprise me that you're getting really good numbers having a small focused and highly engaged list. I always say we're small, but we're potent. That's actually a good tweetable. We're small but steady or small small but potent. Small and steady wins the race. It's, it's really true because they participate with me, and I love it. And that's what you want. That's how you create a buy-ready list. That's why I titled the podcast episode, this episode, What I Did, is because I know from years of doing this that, again, big lists mean absolutely nothing, but quality means everything absolutely everything and in the era that we have lived in on internet marketing as I've been involved with this so many years where we have people that are constantly shoving down our throats uh, especially in the online marketing space about list building and building a big list and talking about this ad nauseum and seeing people literally throw <laughs> thousands of dollars into buying ads and building big lists and still struggling to make sales you know, it, it really, it, to me, it's, it, I feel like it's actually frustrating for us as creative entrepreneurs, as any entrepreneur, but it's also frustrating for the people who are actually looking for solutions 
signing up for things and not getting the solution that they're signing up for. And so that's why I felt like this topic was so important and why I wanted to bring Danielle on as an example, because she's done such a brilliant job of being able to use basic fundamental internet marketing principles like list building, email marketing, communication, engagement, and so forth, and do it in a way, do it her way, in a way that actually creates transformation for herself, for her bank account, for the people that she serves, and the things that they want and they need. And that's why I felt like this this was such an important topic and why I wanted to bring her on in particular because she's such an inspirational story. And one last thing on the subject I wanted to say, you know, not everyone that's going to opt in for your email list is going to buy your service. That's just a given. We already discussed that. We know that to be the case. But again, if the audience is engaged, if the audience is reading what you're sending out and they're engaging with you, talking to you, even if they're not even an ideal, if they personally aren't 100% ideal fit for your product or service, you now have cemented an impression of yourself on them. So when someone is someone that they know in their circle, meaning your readers, they know someone that needs what you have to offer, I'm sure they'll be more than happy to give you a referral, as Danielle can attest. Yes, I've had that done. I can personally vouch for that. I've had that done. I have people on my list that don't even have a pet, but they love animals. Mm -hmm. And soon, this has nothing to do with this interview, but I'm going to be developing... Um, for workaholics especially, um, supervised uh, pet visits um, where they can um, come and enjoy a dog or a cat for an hour and get their kitty or puppy fix because there's a lot of people that fit that category. There are. Oh, I love that. I think that's a brilliant idea. So you get a chance to experience uh, what it's like to spend time with a pet without the full-time responsibility and ownership. I think that's a great idea. But, you know, we could talk all day, so I guess I'm just going to have to have you back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope I answered some things that you mm. wanted. Absolutely. You totally did. I'm definitely going to have to have you back. Good. So, yeah, definitely, as you develop some new products and some new things, I definitely want to have you back on the show so we can talk about those things and also how your, how your efforts are doing with your online marketing and how you're doing with your list building. So, as I've said throughout the episode, the, all the show notes and all the resources, everything we've talked about and a few that have come to mind since we started the interview are going to be available on getpaidforyourcreativity.com forward slash 017 for episode 17. Uh, I'm going to put links in there to Danielle's Facebook page as well as her website. You can also uh, check out her assessment, uh, the tool that she uses, uh, Viral Quiz Builder, I believe, and List Pages, and some other resources, like I said, that's come to mind. So everything that um, we've talked about is going to be there in those show notes. So before we wrap up, this has been a pretty extensive interview, but we'll, before we wrap up, I want to ask Danielle if she has any final thoughts for us that she wants to uh, close the interview out with. Yes, I do. For your VFO, guys, make sure it is on the front page of your website, and it is hard to miss. Mine is a big blue paw, big blue paw on the right side. Now you got to do is push the paw, and it sends you right to the VFO. Make it simple. People are busy and make it fun, and don't make it like they have to go on a treasure hunt. Make it easy to find. And as Danielle said, put it everywhere. Put it all over your site. Put it on your blog post. Uh, make it, put it on the sidebar. Put it on the top of your website. There's a, a tool called Notification Bar, which I'll also put inside of the show notes as well. And you can add those plugins or tools onto your website if you're using WordPress. I'm sure there's something similar if you use Squarespace. But again, you really want to be very, you, you do not want to be shy about the promotion of your, your free offer. You want to put it, make it prominent everywhere. So if you write blog post, you want to embed uh, the offer to opt in for your freebie in your blog post. Again, put it on your sidebar, put it on the top of the website, everywhere. Um, even consider using a pop-up box, which I know some people consider annoying, but they do work for conversion. They do help you to get more leads. So don't be shy about sharing it. <laughs> 
So I'm so glad that you were able to join me for this interview with Danielle. I apologize for a little bit of the technical. We had of some issues with my end of the recording, so I had to kind of splice in my own recording because my portion sounded really, really bad. So I wanted to make sure it was as clear as possible and that you could hear us both. Uh, clearly. So that's what I have for you. So everything that we talked about again is on the show notes page at getpayforyourcreativity.com forward slash 017 for episode 17. Feel free to check that out and uh, join me on Instagram. I would love to get your feedback on Instagram, what you think about it. You can send me a direct message. The everything to how to connect with me on Instagram is also on the show notes page. I also put Danielle's uh, Ask Danielle for Pets Facebook page as well as her website address in there. So say say hello to her on her Facebook page as well. I'm sure she'd love to hear from you. And make sure you tell her how you heard about her. And again, if you have a pet and you are curious about her services or you just uh, dog cat friendly, uh, check out the assessment, or you're just curious about how to how she actually put her assessment together. Again, go to her website. The show note, the link is in the show notes, and go over there and check it out. And um, let me know what you think about it. So anyway, this is what I have for you for this week. I'm going to have another episode coming out next week to continue our conversation on creating irresistible free offers and list building. And I can't wait to share what I have for you next. So have a good week, and I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye.